Hello and welcome back to Breaking Monero, the series where we critically look at some of Monero's privacy and security limitations in order to inform people about better what these are. I'm back as Justin. We have Sarang back on today. Also, we're happy to have you today. Today, we're talking about timing attacks. Now, timing attacks are another very nuanced topic. There's things that sort of get right and wrong, right? And so we want to help explain the situation a little bit better for people so that they have a better understanding about what information can be learned about them and then end with uh, some key takeaways that users can, can use and consider as they're sending transactions. Um, so Sarang, can you start us off about some of the considerations about when you are running a node, what the sort of limitations are there for, for individuals? Sure. So, I mean, the idea behind running a node is that you may be relaying transactions from other nodes onto the network, which, of course, is how um, the network basically learns about transactions. But you yourself may be, you know, constructing transactions and sending them yourselves. Uh, so timing about when your node is active, for example, when it is accepting incoming connections and making outgoing connections to other nodes may reveal a little bit of information about the transaction structure. Um, so, for example, if I have a node that's running 24 seven and has a whole bunch of transactions passing through it, it may be more difficult for an adversary to determine which of those transactions I'm simply relaying on and which actually originated from me. But of course, if I only come online every so often for a brief period of time, send out a transaction or two, and then go back offline, that may be an indication to that adversary that the transactions that are being sent out were in fact originated by me. So the timing about when a node is running is something to consider. And of course, we know that in general, you know, the more nodes that are online relaying transactions, that increases the security of the network anyway. So do you think it's fair to say that if, if an adversary was trying to have a high level of knowledge over the network, they would try and prioritize, um, or they would look first at nodes that they've recently connected to and then have disconnected over a short period of time? I mean, it's difficult to say what methods an adversary might use, um, but that's a pretty strong one. So, you know, in general, if you're going to be using a node, it's probably best to be running it all the time and allow a lot of transactions to kind of, you know, filter through it and be relayed in order to ensure that your own transactions are as hidden as possible within that crowd. Thanks, Ryan. And um, it's worth noting too, that this isn't really a Monero specific recommendation for other security and privacy software like Tor and I2P. They generally recommend that users run the software all the time, even if you're not using it. So um, you should not just run an I2P router only when you're routing on the I2P network. Likewise, you should not run a Monero node only if you want to sync and broadcast transactions. You should ideally try and run it the whole time. Um, OK, so what about when you're syncing with remote nodes, Sarang? Well, we were talking a bit about this earlier before the recording about how um, the structure is a little bit different. And of course, we talked about remote nodes and some of the limitations and the trust that you're implicitly placing in a remote node. If you connect, for example, with a mobile device that doesn't have the capability to run one on its own. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is that, you know, especially if you're running on, say, a mobile device whose IP and, you know, apparent geolocation is going to be changing over time. You know, if you connect to a remote node, for example, you request blocks that you haven't seen yet. So, for example, if I run a uh, if I run a Monero wallet on my phone, for example, that's connecting to some you know open remote node, you know that node sees that I request a certain number of blocks, and then you know I maybe go offline and stop connecting to it because I'm done for a while, and then from a different location, a different IP, I appear to perhaps be a different identity. I might connect to that same remote node again and start requesting the next set of blocks. So if the remote node is keeping track of you know, which entities are requesting which sets of blocks, the node might make infer you know, inferences about the, you know, if I am in fact that same entity, even though you know, my phone is connecting from a different IP. Interesting, uh, interesting. thank you, Sarang. Um, so um, to move on a little bit, um, we can sort of summarize like when people should send transactions and, and what people can really do to mitigate some of this information. And there's a number of basic strategies that we sort of have outlined. Um, and they each sort of come with their own drawbacks, unfortunately. So you can say that users can send them randomly. You should literally pick a random time over a day interval. But then maybe you would choose an off-peak time with the Monero network and Maybe all, the only people sending transactions during that time are usually those that are sending them according to a random parameter. 
Um, or perhaps uh, if you set them under certain times when more people are likely to use them, it could be a more predictable behavior that you sort of try and, and observe. So ultimately, it's hard to say which one's really the best because you can really develop a heuristic for both of these and we don't really know which one is more powerful. But just know that there's sort of limitations with, with both with both of these two different types of strategies and how people approach them. And we can look to sort of the Zcash turnstile process to see how they have sought to limit um, some of the timing attack metadata as people send funds from a shielded Sprout address to a transparent address to a, a shielded Sapling address that you with their sort of turnstile process, they made it so you try and fit in with the rest of the crowd in a way it was sort of like a, an interactive process where you try and make sure many people are doing it at the same time. Um, and that's the, the main point of that is actually to help with timing attacks, to help make it so that it's not obvious that only one entity is transacting over certain periods of time. Um, so, um, Serang, one question a lot of people have with the Monero wallet, and it's kind of a user experience drawback, is that we limit people to have at least 10 confirmations for their transactions before they're able to send another one. Why does Monero do this, and what are the real benefits from this? Well, you know, the idea, um, one of the ideas behind this is that, you know, we've talked before kind of way back when we talked a bit about forks in the network, um, that, you know, the network and the chain will tend to kind of fork itself, you know, in very small and kind of limited ways, just because different miners, you know, may come up with different blocks around the same time and kind of create these little teeny little tributary style forks, you know, but eventually those kind of just get rolled into one solid chain. So, you know, on one hand, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, users have enough confirmations to ensure that the outputs that they are sending, you know, are on, in, you know, are on the main chain. And how many blocks does that take? Well, you know, statistically we know that the more blocks you wait, the more likely it is that you are in fact on the main chain. And you know, the longest kind of reorganizations of chains that we've seen are maybe on the order of 20 blocks. But these are extremely rare. Um, it's more likely that, you know, the number we set, something like 10 blocks, ensures that, you know, you're very, very likely on the main chain without kind of degrading the user experience too much. And of course, you can probably talk about, you know, other benefits that we get to this as well. Yeah, sure. On top of that too, um, like you don't want to generate transactions with decoys that were generated on a chain that doesn't exist anymore, right? Like that, that's unfortunate because either the transaction might not be properly verified. Actually, that's a good question. Sorry, would the transaction just not be verified or would it be verified with information that everyone would know would be false? Um, it would have to be with information that is relative to that node's knowledge of the chain. Okay, so interesting, okay, so you couldn't send a transaction using a decoy in one chain and then it to be included on another one. And again, like this is, this is one of the things that, you know, eventually small tributary forks kind of, you know, I want to say just kind of go away eventually as, you know, a solid single main longer chain um, mm -hmm. is established over time. So, yeah. you know, in general, it's good, it's good to wait. You know, it's, a, it's not really a consensus thing. It's, it's a wallet thing, but it's there for good reason. Um, you know, and yeah. it's also worth noting too that, you know, the way we talked earlier about the way that we select decoys and, you know, there's all sorts of considerations with that, some of which are very subtle, uh, but it's worth noting that, you know, the decoy selection algorithm that in some sense takes some kinds of timing into account also does in fact account for this. Yeah, so, so it's exactly. Of things so where, you know, if, you're, if you're doing the default behavior, you know, in, in that sense, the output selection is taking it into account. Yeah, and I think, so to summarize the sort of, the, the 10 confirmation window for people is to make sure that their transactions get broadcast on the correct chain and that there's they're seeing that that actually happens and then it's also to say that um the selection it's a, to account for latency issues with the selection algorithm too where not everyone would necessarily see everything except for a certain period of time so we need to make sure that the whole network really has visibility over this transaction before you just start to try and send another that, does that summarize it pretty well? To make a long story longer, sure. <laughs> Perfect. All right. So, um, what about some of the like uh, the connections between IP addresses and time? And we're going to have a separate episode entirely on IP addresses. Go much more in detail there. But what about the portions that are related specifically to like the incremental advantage that timing could provide uh, for an adversary? Um, well, you know, I mean. 
So an adversary who is looking for, you know, connecting to you and is aware of your IP address, of course, we know there's some things involving geolocation of IP addresses. Um, you know, there's also information about timing caused by, you know, what, what transactions are coming out of that, what time is that node active. Um, you can make a lot of inferences based on activity, for example, um, based on things like time zone, which could give you inferences about location. So there's, there's a lot of like little pieces of, of, of metadata that are kind of floating around there. Um, you know, if, if, for example, you can make an inference about a user's time zone, you might make an inference about, you know, when they're likely to be asleep and therefore probably not active sending any transactions on the network. You know, all of this gives out some little heuristic information about when you see transactions, what you know about when that user is likely to send transactions of their own. And again, this goes back to the whole idea of, can I infer that a transaction that I see coming out of a node is just being relayed on from somebody else or in fact originated from that node? And of course the idea ideally is that you don't want that to be determinable. So you want to ensure that all transactions appear like they are equally likely to have come from you or just from someone else. You know, and I'm sure that, you know, if you think about it hard enough, you can come up with a whole lot of different heuristics that an adversary might try to use based on your IP and different forms of timing, and time zone and location and all of that. Are there any last comments you want to add on timing metadata before we move on to the sort of actionable information for people? You know, just, just that, you know, some of the things are fairly specific to Monero. For example, the way that, you know, we have to select decoys and therefore have to account for certain timing things. Um, but, you know, a lot of these other things are a lot more general to kind of the way that networks are generally set up, um, the way that routing happens, you know, the way that, um, the way that in general transactions are broadcast in a way that might not be specific to Monero, but might be common to other, you know, assets like Bitcoin and Litecoin, for example. Um, but just that, you know, in general, the goal with a lot of these things is to ensure that you, you know, are basically hidden in a crowd and don't stand out in what you're doing. You know, and of course there's different kind of mitigations and solutions that can, you know, that folks are trying to come up with to, to mitigate this. For example, kind of like network level solutions like Tor and I2P and other things you might've heard of, you know, to different kinds of routing solutions. You know, there's different proposals on, you know, how to change the way that your node connects to and routes transactions in order to make sure that an adversary observing the whole network is less likely to be able to determine any information. So, you know, like many things and like many things involving network theory, you know, there's a lot of different layers that we can act at. But, you know, Monero, as always, tries very hard to apply an iterated, layered approach to its privacy, you know, and we continue to iterate on that kind of at the routing and network layer as well, albeit maybe more slowly than we'd like. Yeah, it really is its own sort of topic in conversations because it's not, we, we don't just need to learn from Monero's history. We, really can, we can really pull from any peer-to-peer -peer network uh, to learn more. Um, so for this actionable information, um, we have some few basic steps for people. The first and most obvious one is if you can run your own full node and when you're running it, keep it running 24 seven, right? <laughs> Make sure it's always connected. Don't only run it and sync it when you're trying to send transactions. You should ideally be contributing all the time. So you're constantly sending information back and forth. You're sending transactions onto other nodes that you don't even send. And as a result, it just helps you um, ultimately uh, with your, your security. Um, but also one thing that uh, sort of that I think is pretty interesting is if you run an open node, sort of like a Monero world style node that you use uh, that other people connect to your node for in order to send transactions through you, that can actually help your um, privacy by um, making it so that other many other people are sending transactions through your node not just you. So in addition to all the other normal propagation data that's being sent from your node, you're also getting brand new information from other people that's coming from your node for the first time. So if an adversary is observing your node, they might, like they will struggle to differentiate transactions that you send out compared to transactions that other people send out. So I think that's pretty interesting. Yeah. What do you think about a sort of like transaction delay string? Like, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's something that can be helpful. I mean, I think that can be helpful as well, right? You know, some some people and and you know other projects as well might you know uh, might advocate the idea of you know delaying when a transaction is sent out relative to when the transaction is actually constructed, you know, or made on your device, um, and that can be helpful. You know, it that you know any anything that you can do to you know ensure that any patterns in your transaction behavior are you know in some sense kind of randomized is generally a good thing. 
you know, to what extent you should do that randomization over what time period, you know, I would say that that's kind of up for debate and might depend on other factors involving, you know, patterns and network activity. But, you know, in general, if you can do it, it's probably, it's probably worth your while. So Sarang, ultimately, we, we spent some time talking about the timing attacks. Is this really a consideration that most people really need to concern themselves with? You know, like a lot of other things, I think it really depends on your particular threat and risk model. You know, a lot of it might depend on, you know, whether or not you're operating through, you know, VPNs or other kinds of anonymity networks, you know, whether or not you are concerned about adversaries observing, you know, your network activity in particular, or kind of the global network activity across the entire Monero network. You know, it could have to do with how well connected you happen to be to the internet um, and, to, and to other peers on the network, which, you know, might depend on the level of trust you placed in your ISP or kind of the internet backbone around you. Um, you know, I, I know that for, for most people, what, we're, what we try to do, and I guess what we're trying to do going forward, you know, is ensure that the way that we develop, the way that the software routes um, connects to other nodes on the network, you know, and even other things like, you know, network, la network layer solutions, you know, ideally try to kind of make some of this transparent to the user. You know, I would say that it's probably not something that a lot of people think about very often. Um, you know, and frankly, a lot of people are probably, you know, privileged enough to not have to maybe worry about this for their particular use cases. Um, but if this is something that does concern you, then, you know, some of these mitigations are something that you probably want to consider um, when you're using Monero, or for that matter, you know, just doing general network connectivity at all. All right. Any final comments you want to have on this topic? It's, 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 very, it's very subtle. And, you know, for every mitigation that you come up with for some kind of timing analysis, you know, there's probably another heuristic that, you know, a very, very determined or different adversary might use, um, you know, and that's not to say that, you know, you should kind of come up with, you know, get, kind of fall into an analysis paralysis trap of saying, well, there will always be new heuristics. So, you know, why use this at all? You know, as always, you know, we, this is kind of a cat and mouse game for which we try to iterate, maybe sometimes more slowly than we'd like, but we do still iterate and improve on it. Okay, thank you, Sarang. Thanks again for everyone who watched. Um, this has been Breaking Monero. We will catch you next time. Bye, everyone. See ya.